Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Mark chapter 6, and we will begin reading in verse 1. And the word of the Sovereign Lord reads, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by, at his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they t- took offense at him. And he said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. This is the word of the Lord. In his commentary, uh, Pastor... um, Kent Hughes cites the English proverb, and he says that familiarity breeds contempt. And what that simply means is we tend to undervalue and sometimes even disdain the things and the people that we're familiar with. We tend to look down or or take for granted those that we know and, and the things that we know. For example, a very common occurrence for people who follow Christ, when they read Christian books, they will read the words of the author um, with, with great interest, but when the author cites a lengthy bit of scripture, particularly a passage that the reader is familiar with, they will tend to skim over it or skip it altogether. They, they tend to read past the scripture. Why? Because they're familiar with it. Right? They, they assume that they know what it means, and they think it's a waste of their time to read something they've read in the past or, or, or something that they think that they already know. They're familiar with it. And it's like, you know what? I already know that. I've already, I've already read that. Another example is, is how, uh, that, that would be is how husbands and wives tend to place a higher value on the opinions of people that are other than their spouses. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Right? You're in a conversation with someone that you know, and, and they say something to you like, you know what, hey, maybe you should take some time off and spend some extra time with your family. And you go, that's a great idea. And you go home to your spouse and you tell them, hey, you know what, I was talking to so-and-so and they said, you know, I should take some time off and spend it with my, with, with my family. I think that's, that's a wonderful idea. And you wonder why they're giving you a dirty look, right? And then, you, and then they finally tell you, it's like, you know what? So, so they told you that, huh? I've been telling you that over and over and over and over again. I've said it multiple times, but you don't listen to me. Right? You'll listen to Bob, but you won't listen to me. Right? If you're married, you know what I'm talking about here. As Bodie Bauckham says, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Right? <laughs> Another example is, is the community that we grow up in. Um, everybody wants to leave their own hometown. It seems that everyone looks down on where they're, they're from. Why? Because it's familiar. When we moved back here to Boron, Kim was not that excited about coming, coming back here because she grew up here. And she knew everybody, and she remembered how people treated each other in a small town, and it's not always good. But, but I quickly fell in love, and so did my oldest son. We quickly fell in love with the community, and Kim said, you know, I grew up here, but it was you and, and our son, Little Sherman, who uh, had given me a better appreciation for, for my own hometown. He said, the problem is with familiarity, is that you're just familiar, right? And, and because you're familiar, you begin to take things for granted and make assumptions and you begin to live by those assumptions. When you, uh, you come to know someone at a certain level and in a certain way and you just expect them to be that way for the rest of their lives and for all the time that you will ever know them. And the idea of change for them or them doing something different is impossible. I, I, I've often said that one of the great things about family is that they know who you are. But one of the worst parts about family is that they think that they know who you are. And it's the same with friendships. And it can be the same with your, with your work. It can be the same with the work relationships. And it can even be the same with, with faith. One of the difficulties that we have in sharing our faith in America is people are familiar with Christianity. They've heard about it. 
A lot of people are somewhat familiar with the Bible, and, and, and most people are somewhat familiar with, with the gospel. And so they tend to dismiss it because they're familiar. And this is even worse for those who make a profession of faith at some point in their life, but they're not really believers. And you come to them and you share the gospel with them, and they're like, I know that. I know all about that. You do? Yeah. Ah, I, heard the, I heard that one time at church, and I came forward and, you know, when I was invited, and, and I invited Jesus into my heart, and I was saved, even though that their lives bear no fruit at all of their salvation. They, they've been inoculated, so to speak, against the gospel because they're familiar with it. And even as Christians, we can be, be familiar to the point that, um, you know, that we fall in the same mindset. We come to faith in Christ, and we begin to learn some things, and we are hungry and excited, and we begin to follow Jesus, and then we begin to develop this picture of who we think God is, and we become very comfortable in that. And so we become really familiar with the image of God that we've created, that we no longer apply ourselves to really wanting to grow and know Him better. We don't feel challenged, and we don't feel like we need to dig into the Word and really, really get at who He really is. We don't feel the need to ever challenge our own assumptions, even, even though that God is infinite and bigger than our imaginations. We get very comfortable with our understanding and we stop maturing because familiarity is, is comfortable. And, and as we've all experienced, all of us have experienced this kind of familiarity either by giving or receiving. I already know that. I know who she is. Yeah, I know all about him. Oh, they would never, they would never do that. Yep, that's the kind of person he is for sure. We all know what it's like to be so familiar with uh, with people having been so familiar with us that they just dismiss us. And we know what it's like to do the same to other people. And, and, And that right there is the issue that Jesus is facing here in this text. Jesus is going to go home and preach the gospel to a group of people who think that they know who he is. So turn with me to Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And it says, and he went away from there, which there is Capernaum, because that's where the story left off, and came to his hometown. Now, it doesn't say the word Nazareth here, but that's, but that's where Jesus' hometown was after um, he fled to Egypt with his parents, they came back and settled in Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. And the reason why his disciples followed him is because this was not a family visit. This is an official visit. This is, he is there to preach the gospel, and he has brought with him his entourage. This is an official ministry visit to the city of Nazareth. And what you may not realize is that this is not the first time that Jesus was home preaching the gospel in his hometown. Because when we open up the Gospel of Mark, he jumps right in and declares that Jesus is the Son of God. And then he gets right into the passage where he's baptized and goes out into the wilderness and is tempted for 40 days by Satan. And then after that, it says John the Baptist was beheaded and Jesus came to the region of Galilee and began his ministry preaching the Gospel. Proclaiming the time is now, the kingdom is here, and the way into the kingdom is to repent and believe the Gospel. And after that, Jesus calls his first disciples and he preaches in the synagogue in the city of Capernaum for the very first time. But Mark does not give us the detail about what happened between Jesus beginning his ministry and the calling of his first disciples. But Luke does. Luke in his gospel um, tells us that. In fact, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. It's just a few pages to the right. Luke chapter 4. You can hold yourself in in the other place if you'd like. Luke chapter 4. Luke is just... Uh, like I said, just a little bit of the right. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, and it reads, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, because it's where he grew up as a little boy. And as it was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up and read. Probably because it was his turn, because all the men in the synagogue took turns reading the text. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
And he began saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Or in other words, you have been waiting for the Messiah to come and to set things right. Well, here I am. I am the Messiah. I'm the one prophesied about in this scripture. I am the Son of God. And, and, those, and it, it, that was what he, he basically said to those in his hometown. And after everything seemed to be okay, at least for the moment, it says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. But then it turns bad to worse because of familiarity. And then he said, Is this not Joseph's son. Or in other words, wait a minute. We know this guy. We know who he is. What do you mean you're the Messiah? What do you mean you're the Son of God? Right? How can that be? We know who you are, kid. We, we saw you grow up. And then he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me the pro proverb, physician, heal yourself. And what you have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And what Jesus was saying is, I, don't, I know you don't believe me because you think you know me. And so you're going to ask me to do miracles right here, right? That, that, that you've heard about me doing in Capernaum, that you want me to prove to you that I am who that I say that I am and what I'm saying is true. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Or in other words, you're not going to believe me anyway. You're not going to believe me anyway because you think that you know me. And so, no, I am I'm not going to do miracles before you because you, like your forefathers who refused to listen to the prophets of old, right? And, and God didn't allow them to do miracles uh, for those poor, uh, those people either, but rather he sent him to do miracles elsewhere, to people who weren't even Jews. And you're just like those unbelieving hypocrites is really roughly what he's saying. And this really upsets his home crowd. And it says, And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. They were, they were bitter and angry. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so they could throw him, look at this, so they could throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So the first time he preached the gospel in his hometown, the result was that his own community tried to kill him. Why? Because they thought they knew him. And because they thought they knew him, their hearts were hardened to him. And because their hearts were hardened, they refused to give him, they, they refused to give him any credibility at all. And so he refused to give them a sign or a miracle. And this offended them. Because who is this carpenter's son? And who does he think he is claiming to be the Messiah? Psh, we know who he is. And so he left. And he went and he preached in Capernaum. In the, in the area of Galilee. And, and while he was there, he calls his disciples, and he spends about a year preaching the gospel, healing people, and casting out demons, and he begins to really do mind-blowing miracles, like we, what we saw the last few weeks where he calmed the, the storm, you know, a hurricane, basically, on the, sea, on, on the Sea of Galilee. He also cast out not just a demon, but a legion of demons out of a man. He also healed a woman of, of an incurable disease, and then he, he also then raised a little girl back from the dead, which the news of, of those kinds of miracles surely made their way back to Nazareth. And, and so now, after about a year of ministry, Jesus returns home. He leaves Capernaum, goes back to Nazareth, but this time his disciples are with him, which means, again, this is not a family visit. This is not a pleasure trip. He is not there to catch up and, and have a barbecue. Right? This is an official ministry delegation. Jesus came with his disciples, not as a local man, but as a traveling rabbi with a message from God. And he makes, makes a point to say nothing until the Sabbath day. And then it says in verse 2, And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Which is, again, the custom at the time. It was a custom for the, that the traveling rabbis and teachers were invited by the local rulers to read the text and preach on it. Now, some might say, well, why... Would they listen to him now? I mean, they tried to kill him before. Why they, would they give him the time now? Well, well two reasons. Number one, um, he has a following of disciples now, and that gives him legitimacy as, as a teacher. He had a growing number of disciples who take him serious and follow him around and are devoted to him, right, like other rabbis do. So he has a following. Number two, they probably heard about all the things that Jesus has done and the crowds that followed him around. 
This probably made them curious. Remember, Jesus' own family had heard about what was going on in Capernaum, and what did they do? They went to Capernaum to try to take him by force, to take him home, because they thought he was out of his mind. And while they were there, they got to witness the huge crowds that followed him everywhere he went. And they probably even saw Jesus healing people and casting out demons. And so these people, you know, his family probably, you know, probably went back and told the community what was going on. So it was probably common knowledge in Nazareth. If you have to think about it, um, Nazareth was only about 500 people, which means word would spread faster there than it does here in Boron, even with social media. And because of that, they invite him to preach, and then he does. And and many of, of, of who heard him, it says, were astonished, which is really a common reaction when you hear Jesus' preaching. Jesus' words astonish people because here's this nobody from nowhere speaking with authority that exceeds even the greatest of rabbis at the time. And you've got to think about this was a a competitive kind of market to be in. There were a lot of really great rabbis and eloquent speakers. But Jesus, his words are astonishing because he exceeds even them. No one spoke like Jesus. Now, when Jesus preached in Capernaum, his preaching was met with that astonishment, but was followed by miracles. In fact, Jesus, and Mark records that Jesus, he preached in the synagogue for the first time there. And then what happened? A demon-possessed man came forward, and Jesus cast out the demon. And then he spends the rest of the night healing people of all kinds of diseases. And and the reason for that is because they were open, at least, to Jesus' message. Now, it doesn't mean that every person believed in him, but at least they they were willing to hear him and be open to him. But in in Nazareth, it's a different story. He preaches, and the people are are astonished by what he says, but they're astonished for different reasons. They are astonished because because they cannot believe that this guy that that they've known all their lives, right, is talking like he is and saying the things that he is. They can't believe this guy that they know is claiming to be the Messiah. Notice what it says here. They they, 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 They were saying, where did this man get these things? What is, this, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? I want you to notice that they're not denying what he's saying. In fact, what they, they're, they're actually calling what he says wisdom. They understand the truth of his words. They just, it just can't be from him because they, they know him. And they're not denying even his miracles. They affirm that he's done mighty works by his own hands. They cannot deny his power or his authority, just like the Pharisees couldn't deny it either. But notice their attitude in spite of the miracles. It says, is this not the carpenter? Right? This, this, they, they point to the fact that, that he is a, a working man. <laughs> that he is just a working man, just like the rest of us. This is not a classically trained rabbi. He's not a doctor. He doesn't have a PhD. He didn't go to rabbinical school. He didn't follow around another rabbi and was his disciple and and got trained by him. He didn't have any, any degrees. He was just a carpenter. Now, the Jews valued people who worked hard, and they valued tradesmen, but they made a distinction between the common class and the elite class, just like today. There's very clearly a shortage in our country of tradespeople who can do the jobs that are, that are available. And those who go to trade school, it's a proven fact, those who go to trade school make more money faster than those who, who go to college and even get a master's degree. But for some reason, for some reason, people look down on the kids who choose trade school over the university as, as being unwise. They look at kids who go to trade school instead of the university as less intelligent or not as smart as those who go into debt to get a degree that doesn't even guarantee them to get a job. There's a tendency in our culture to look down on those who work with their hands over people who work in an office. As if working with your hands makes you less intelligent. It, it, you know... But this isn't anything new. This is not a new um, prejudice. It's the same here. Jesus was a working man. He was obviously not a scribe or a Pharisee. They'd known him all of his life. They'd seen his work. They knew his background and who he was. And so they were like, where's this carpenter getting this stuff from? And then they get really personal. 
This is one of those details in the Bible that should actually offend you a little bit. Because they say, isn't this the son of Mary? And I want you to notice, this is a detail that's really important. They don't refer to him by his father's name, which was the custom. They always referred to someone by their father's name. In fact, we still do that today. When, when people get married, the wife typically takes the husband's name. And the children are typically named after the father's last name. And it's been that way through all of recorded history. People are identified by their father. Now, why then are they identifying Christ by his mother? Well, most scholars agree that this is intended as an insult to, to Christ. They don't call him the son of Joseph because they've already heard the stories about his birth. And in essence, what they're saying is Jesus was an illegitimate child by saying what they're saying. In other words, they are basically calling him a bastard. That's what that word means, by the way. And that his mom, because of that, was, had an illicit relationship. Right? And the insinuation is that his mom was unfaithful, and Jesus then was the product of this shameful tryst. You see, the people in that community really had no respect for him. <coughs> this, is, this is part of Jesus' life that we don't think about. That people really had no problem going to the worst kind of insult to Christ. And then they refer to his brothers saying that he's the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us. Now, only, not only did they, they know him, they knew his entire family. It's kind of like here in Boron, you know everybody. Right? You know their kids and their grandkids and their cousins. In fact, if you've lived here long enough, you figure out that most people are related to each other somehow, right? And, and yes, Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, contrary to the opinion of, of the Roman Catholic Church, Jesus' mom was not a perpetual virgin. She did have other children. And we talked about that several weeks back. And, and though we don't know much about his sisters or Simon or Joseph, we do know that James eventually put his faith in his brother Jesus and became a leader in the church of Jerusalem, and he wrote the book of James. And Judas, likewise, wrote, um, after the resurrection, wrote the book of Jude. But the point is that they were looking down on Jesus and his entire family. They were really nobodies, because they were nobody from nowhere. In fact, they were like the lowliest of the low. A lowly working man who, who was thought to be an illegitimate child of a woman who supposedly had a shady past, and everybody knew him. Again, remember, the town's 500 people. Everybody knows everyone. And everybody's up in everybody's business. You think Boron is bad? Well, this was, this was worse. And so these people literally grew up with Christ since he was very little, and they looked down upon him. In fact, it says they took offense at him. Now, this word offense is, is familiar to us. We've talked about this word before. It's from the Greek word that means to scandalize. Right? It means for them to... It, 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 for them, this was a scandal. This was a stumbling block to them. Uh, this man that they knew all their life, doing the things that he was doing, saying the things that he's saying, and claiming to be the unique son of God is simply a scandal. He was a nobody from nowhere, and they knew him. So how could this possibly be? I, I mean, can we blame them? I mean, think about this. If, if one of the kids from the youth group you know, had graduated from high school, and came up here before the church and says, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. I'm going to bring about world peace and world hunger. And I'm going to cut taxes for everyone. What's your reaction going to be? Yeah, yeah right, kid. Just keep dreaming. All right? These people were offended by the Christ, by who Christ claimed to be. They were offended because they, because they thought they knew him. But to make it worse, they were, they were they were denying him and rejecting him in spite of the evidence. Right? Just like the Pharisees, they couldn't discount the wisdom and they, and they couldn't, you know, about what he was saying, and they couldn't deny the power of his miracles that he was doing. They, they obviously knew that he was doing miracles, but they just simply refused to believe. And Jesus said to them, again, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and, his own, and in, in his own household. See, Jesus repeats the criticism that he offered before of those who know him. Familiarity breeds contempt. In Capernaum, 25 miles away, I mean, we're, the distance between here and Cal City, there were people who believed in him. 
There were people who, not, no, they didn't believe him as the son of God, but they, they certainly didn't outright reject him. Right? And in Capernaum, he was basically a celebrity. In Capernaum, he, for many people, he was a hero. In Capernaum, at least people were, thought he was entertaining, at least wanted to see the show. But not in Nazareth. What he says and does gives him no credibility whatsoever. It gives him no honor at all because they think they know him. And Jesus makes it clear that this unbelief is not just limited to the people in his town. It extended to even his own relatives and even the members of his own immediate family. Remember, right, in his, his, his own family, his brothers and his mother didn't believe in him. They thought he was crazy. They came to Capernaum to take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. Jesus is once again rejected by those who knew him the best. Again, familiarity breeds contempt. And then it says, and he could not do mighty works there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. There are only two places in the entire Bible that says that Jesus marveled or that he was astonished. There's another way to say that. Because that's what the Greek word thaumatso means. It means to, be, to marvel or to be amazed or to be astonished. And only twice has this happened in the Bible. First, at the unbelief of these people in this town, but then also in Matthew chapter 8, uh, where the centurion comes to Jesus, a, a Gentile comes to Jesus, asks him to heal his servant, and Jesus says, I'll go heal him. And the centurion's like, no, 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 you just say the word, and he'll be healed. Right? And, it, it, and it says that Jesus marveled and said, To those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus was amazed by the faith of this Gentile who didn't really even know anything about Jesus except that he could heal people. And then he was also then likewise amazed by the unbelief of those people who did know him. All of his life, in spite of the evidence that he was giving them, they refused to believe. And because of that blatant unbelief, Jesus didn't do anything, any mighty works, except to heal a few sick people, which, which I think bears two important observations. Number one, how jaded do you have to be to not consider healing someone a mighty work, right? I, I mean, what do you want? I mean, today, even if somebody comes to us and we pray for them who's sick or who's injured, you know, I mean... You know, Brad's cousin, like we pray for for something to happen and it happens. We're like, we praise the Lord, right? We're not even in Jesus' presence and we praise the Lord, right? And just imagine if you, someone who has double pneumonia, and that's been going around a lot, right? But you have double pneumonia, you can't even hardly breathe. You're coughing your lungs out. Jesus comes and he touches you and he heals you instantaneously and your lungs are clear, right? You don't think that's a mighty work of God? How hard-hearted are these people? Number two. Secondly, this text clearly says Jesus could not do any mighty work there. And the Greek is not ambiguous in its language. In fact, every English translation says that he could not do any mighty work there. Which then brings us to an important question. And the question is, why? Is Jesus, if he's omnipotent, then why could he not do mighty works? I mean, is this a picture of Jesus trying to heal people, but he's just not able to because of their unbelief? Was he trying to cast out demons, right? But he's, but he's powerless. Oh, I just can't do it. As if Christ, who demonstrated complete authority over all the created and spiritual world, who according to John is the creator of the entire universe itself, that Jesus is somehow impotent to do anything because of their unbelief. Well, really, the the question betrays the logic. Because as we said last week, what makes faith powerful isn't faith itself. It is the object of our our faith. And the object of our faith is still the all-powerful, all powerful Jesus Christ. And guess what? Jesus is still all powerful even when people don't believe. He healed people who didn't believe that he was the Messiah. It's one of the things that we miss when we, when we look at a text like this. John chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who was unable to walk 
And he was laying by the pool of the sheep gate called Bethsaida, Bethsaida hoping that someone would put him in that dirty, nasty water because the legend was if, if an angel stirred the water up and you got put into the water, then you would be healed. And he was hoping somebody would do that. And Jesus healed that man. The man didn't even know who he was. The man didn't ask him, hey, brother, will you heal me? I've heard about you. He didn't even know. Jesus just healed him. No faith on his part was required. Not to mention, when Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples woke him up because they thought that, that not because they thought that he would, could calm the storm. They woke him up because they were like, why is this dude sleeping? Doesn't he even care that we're about to die? He needs to help us. He needs to help like pull the sails or do whatever we got to do to get through this storm. They were not expecting for him to calm the storm because the way that they reacted when he did. He calms the storm. They're like, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus was able to calm the storm even though they didn't even know or believe that he could do so. So understand, it isn't about Jesus being constrained against his will. He is still omnipotent and he is still sovereign. Jesus is God in the flesh and can do whatever he wants to do and no one can stop him. As Kent Hughes in his commentary notes, he, goes, he says like this, he says, let me be clear. Jesus could, do, could not do miracles because he would not. Omnipotence is not omnipotence. It's just bound by anything but its own will. Jesus was morally compelled not to show his power. In fact, he says, Matthew makes this clear. Matthew records it as saying, and he did not do any mighty works there because of their unbelief. Danny Aiken in his commentary likewise says, how could the omnipotent son of God be bound, limited by unbelief of Nazareth? He could not do miracles because he would not in the face of blatant unbelief. Morally and spiritually, he was constrained not to reveal his power in such an environment of rejection and belief. The point is Jesus didn't do mighty works because their hearts were hard. He was not going to allow them to make a mockery of his divine power because these people were not going to believe anyway. Didn't matter what he does. Just like the Jews of old. In fact, I once talked to an atheist friend of mine, um, somebody that I grew up with. I knew since I was a little guy. We're talking about like five or six years old. And, and we had many conversations over the years about faith. And he said to me, I'm not going to believe I'm not going to believe in God until, you know, until he comes down here and shows himself to me. Now, understand, this guy grew up around my family, and he has many family members that are still you know, very devoted believers, people who have shown this man exceptional grace in spite of his life of addiction and years of rebellion and the way that he's hurt people in his family. They have loved him and shown incredible grace to him. People whose lives have been radically transformed and changed by the grace of God. And I told him my own story about how I was an atheist just like him and how God changed my life. And he knew me. He knew all about me. And, and I asked him, how could he explain then the conversion of someone like me? And he said he's not going to believe. He's not going to believe, even though he could not deny the change in my own life, the, the visible evidence in my own life. Because the truth is, he was deceiving himself. Because no amount of information, no amount of truth, no miracles are going to cause this man to believe. Right? He had made up his mind that he was not going to believe. People like him, believing that experiencing a miracle would change their minds, is just, it's just simply not true. Because that's what we see here in the book of Mark. These people, like, just like the Pharisees, could not deny what Jesus had done. Right? They, yet they, they, they saw it, they witnessed it. Yet they wouldn't believe. And because of that, there was no point from him doing any mighty works. It was a fruitless endeavor because they, because they just simply wouldn't believe. You see, Jesus didn't come to do miracles to, to wow crowds. He didn't come to do miracles to be a famous magician. He didn't come to do miracles simply to heal people and cast out demons. He did these things to give authority to his message, which is the gospel, so that people would come and believe the truth and be saved. And these people... They're just not going to believe. And so he does his part. He does what he was supposed to do. He preached the truth to them, and they rejected him. And then he left, and he never looked back. And he went, it says, about among the villages teaching. 
Never again in the entire New Testament does it mention Jesus ever going back to his hometown. Jesus left them essentially to their fate. In fact, the first church that was built in Capernaum was not built until the 4th century, nearly 300 years after Jesus was gone. Because those in his hometown rejected him because they thought they knew him. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now with all that, there's still several lessons we can take from this. The first one is is unbelief is blinding. Unbelief blinds the person to the truth. These people could not deny the wisdom of his teaching. They could not deny the power of his miracles. The people, these people, just like the Pharisees, right, were presented with the evidence, but they would not believe because they were blind. And this right here, brothers and sisters, is the natural state of the unbeliever. Remember, Jesus says, they may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand. Unbelief is spiritual blindness. That's why it shouldn't surprise you. That's why it shouldn't frustrate you when you share your hope with someone and they refuse to acknowledge what you're saying. Seriously, like getting upset about that is like getting upset by the sun coming up. Even though you present compelling evidence, people's unbelief makes them blind to the truth. I mean, think about it. We just got through Easter, and what's the thing that we talked about? That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best attested to historical fact in all of antiquity. There is nothing attested to even close. The evidence for the resurrection is so overwhelming, historically speaking, that if you can't believe in the resurrection, you really don't even have grounds to believe anything else that's happened in ancient history. But the reason why people won't believe in the resurrection is not due to the lack of evidence. It's because they simply refuse to believe in the supernatural, and they understand that if Jesus walked out of that tomb that he is who he says he is, and that means that they are accountable to him. And so they will deny the truth in blind unbelief. Christians are always accused of having blind faith, while non-Christians are guilty of having blind unbelief, in spite of what the evidence says. Because their their, their unbelief, their hardened unbelief, makes them blind to the truth. Secondly, unbelief is destructive. Unbelief is horribly destructive from the very beginning all the way up to right now. John MacArthur notes in a sermon that he preached on this exact same text, he said, I'm just going to quote um, what he said here because he says it better than I can. He says, for example, Eve exercised unbelief in the word of God and brought the entire human race down into a curse and eternal judgment. In the days of Noah, the world would not believe in the world of unbelievers Drown in a flood that, that covered the entire earth. Unbelief caused the destruction of the whole human race and all creatures and all life living on earth. It was unbelief, he continues and says, on the part of Israel in the wilderness that caused them to die there before ever entering the promised land. And the story of Israel's ongoing unbelief, even after they entered the land of Canaan, is clear for all to read in the Old Testament. They were judged again and again by God for their apostasy and their unbelief. He continues and says, he says, Aaron's unbelief led to the death of 3,000 people. Moses' unbelief kept him out of the promised land. Achan's unbelief resulted in his, resulting in his disobedience brought about his execution of him and his entire family. Sennacherib's unbelief, the Gentile king, led to his assassination by his own sons after an angel of the Lord massacred 185,000 of his troops. And of course, then we have the unbelief of Judas which led to his suicide and his everlasting punishment. He says that Pharisees and scribes were unbelievers to the very end, with with few exceptions. And they, like all other unbelievers, their unbelief resulted in them dying in their sins, forfeiting heaven and gaining hell. It is unbelief that's brought a curse on all humanity. It is unbelief that that broke up the fountains of the deep and that brought down the rain from heaven and drowned the entire human race. And it is unbelief in the Son of God that catapults people into eternal hell. Unbelief activates divine wrath. Unbelief activates divine judgment, end quote. Unbelief is horribly destructive. And there are people today, in their blindness, will continue to not 
believe all the way to their doom. Because unless a person repents and believes the gospel, the judgment and the wrath of God still rests upon them. And one day they will meet him face to face, and he will pronounce judgment on them, rightfully so, and cast them in, out of his presence and spend eternity in hell. Unbelief is horribly destructive. But ultimately, unbelief is a result of a hard heart, which is something we talk about all the time. The truth about God falls upon a person's hardened heart, and that truth does not penetrate. As it says, the devil snatches, snatches the truth away, and unbelievers hearts are so hard that the evidence doesn't even matter to them. Miracles don't matter. Even if Christ was to come back right now, it wouldn't matter to some people. Don't believe me? Jesus says in his own words in Luke chapter 16, in a parable about a man named Lazarus, he says, and I'll just read it for you. You don't have to look for it. Luke 16, beginning verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a man, a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with, with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. It's pretty gross. Okay? The poor man died and was carried to the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades being in torment. He lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so, they may be, so that he may warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, or the Bible. Let them, let, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, they won't believe the word of God, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The fact is unbelief is a result of a hardened heart. And unless God supernaturally changes a person's heart, they will remain that way, and nothing will cause them to believe. Which leads to our last truth, and that is unbelief and having a hardened heart is natural. Unbelief and having a heart that's hard is natural to us. It's a natural state of who we are. If you remember Easter when we talked about David... When he was confessing his sin, what did he say? He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. A couple of psalms later in Psalm 53, he says, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, not, they are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Which, by the way, the Apostle Paul repeats that in Romans chapter 3. But then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, And you were, look at that word there, dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil himself, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we... We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He also says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your, look at this, sinful nature. Unbelief is just natural to us. Even though innately we believe that there's a God, because everybody is. The Bible makes it clear there are no... True atheists. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We suppress the truth. We actively suppress the truth. 
For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up into the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped the, and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The natural state of mankind on his own, is unbelief in a hardened heart. And our only hope, our only hope is, is for God to change our hearts. And praise the Lord, he does do that. Amen. He changes people's hearts so they can believe. God promises in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from you the heart of stone, from your, heart of, from, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and notice what the result of that is. So, and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. God is the one who changes hearts. God is the one who changes the hardened heart. Even, even the hardest of ones. What you need to understand is God did change the hearts of some of those who were in Nazareth. Some of those who who were hardened in their unbelief. How do I know that? Because the members of Christ's own household, Jesus' mom and his brothers, uh, James and, and Jude, became believers. Their hearts were changed. How do we know that? Well, we know that for a fact, right? Because, of, because they, they wrote two books of the Bible. In fact, tradition tells us that all his brothers and sisters came to faith. And so God... Hear me on this. God can and does change the hardest of hearts. He can change the heart of even the, those whose unbelief seems to be the most powerful and destructive. He can change the heart of even those who are contemptuously familiar to you. And this, by the way, should give us all hope. Because these people who rejected Christ over and over again, they, they, they rejected him, they thought he was nuts. Which means... If they reject the gospel, then they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. And he is powerful enough to change them, though they may despise you because you're familiar with him. That's why we always say your job isn't to save people. That's God's job. Your job is to sow the seed, love the people, pray that God would change their hearts, and never give up on them. That's what we do, because only Christ can do the impossible. Only God, Christ can change a person's heart. So, wrapping up, how do we apply this? Two quick things. Number one, when you share the hope of Christ with people, don't take rejection personally. Right, this is about following Jesus, right? If you're going to follow Jesus, you understand you have to do what Jesus did, which is to share the hope of Christ, which means you're going to experience rejection. Don't take it personally. If you're a believer in Christ, you were called to be part of the mission. You were called to be all in for the cause of Christ, which means you were called to make disciples of all the nations. Yes, you, you, right where you are, every one of you. And when you encounter people who reject the gospel message, you simply need to understand that this is the default natural response of people whose hearts that are hard. Because the gospel is foolishness, as Paul says, to those who are perishing. A hardened heart is the natural default setting, and unless God changes their hearts, they're going to reject the gospel. So it shouldn't surprise you. It shouldn't hurt your feelings. And what you need to see in this story is that, that they rejected Christ too. They rejected Jesus. He did the miracles that you can't do. right? And he spoke with authority that you can't speak with, and they rejected him too. So don't take it personal. Simply do what God calls you to do, which is to sow the seed, love the people, pray that God would change their hearts, and never give up on them. And then allow God to be God to do the rest. Number two, I think is probably the most important. Believe and keep believing. 
If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, right, but now you are beginning to understand that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and to give you the righteousness that you need to stand before Almighty God as part of His family in heaven rather than facing judgment in hell, then all you need to do is repent and believe the truth about Christ and who He is and what He's done for you. And if you do already believe, you're someone who's already a believer, then the, the, the call is to keep believing to, to keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep believing that Jesus will not leave you or forsake you as he's promised. Keep believing that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Keep believing that God will work all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Keep believing in spite of the fact that some of those that you know and some that know you the best can't or won't believe. Remember and believe that God can change even the hardest of hearts, even the ones that you're familiar with. Trust in him and keep trusting in him. And he will never, ever, ever let you down. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much again for the encouragement of your word. That even in a negative situation that we can see, Lord, encouragement that when we are rejected by those that we love and know when we're rejected by our neighbors when we're rejected by our own family at times for our faith lord that we realize that we're just like you and that lord should encourage us in the fact that lord you're the one that overcomes and that what happens then is normal and that we shouldn't take it personally that we shouldn't take it like we're somehow defective or we failed But ultimately, Lord God, what we need to realize is it's par for the course. It's normal for people to reject you. It's the way things have been since the beginning. And our hope then ultimately doesn't rest in our ability to be more persuasive. Our hope ultimately rests in you, which is really where our hope is always set, is you. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter how successful we may be, no matter how impoverished we may be, the only hope that we have ultimately is you. Whether our friends and our family actually receive you the way that we hope and call them to, right? It's beyond our abilities, but what we can do is know that, Father, you will work all things out for good. And, and, and according to the counsel of your will, Lord, and that, it will, and that you were just and righteous, and that, Father, that we can depend on you to do what is right. And so we lift our hearts and our minds to you, and we... We set our hope on Jesus Christ and Him alone. And we walk in that every day for the rest of our lives. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.